I recently made a video talking about Silent Hill Downpour, which is critically the worst rated Silent Hill. What I did not expect when I made that video was the wars that would ensue in the comment section. People were mad and no one could agree on what was the worst entry, specifically between Downpour and Homecoming. Some absolute mental cases were even arguing that the room was the worst. I mean, what? The room has its issues, sure, but it's a hop, jump and a skip away from being the worst in the franchise. What? But back to Homecoming, a 2008 release and the first mainline entry to be created by a western company. Needless to say, it had a lot riding on it and public opinion was not kind to them. But do you know what game no one hates? That's right, today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid just celebrated their third anniversary as one of the most talked about RPGs out there and they're showing no signs of stopping, adding new content and game modes every couple of months. How about trying your luck in the Doom Tower, offering a whole world of new and terrifying bosses. Sprawling over 120 levels, the Doom Tower brings an exciting new challenge for seasoned players. Last year, Raid even added a whole new faction, the Shadowkin, a tribe of warriors from the Far East recently liberated from their reign of evil. Bosses more your thang? Okay. How about the Hydra Clan boss? Multiple heads, each with their own ability and different strategies required to defeat them? <laughs> what a treat. Raid isn't going anywhere, so why not join the party and download Raid Shadow Legends in the link below. I do like that the game has a massive roster of constantly expanding champions to choose from, it keeps the selection nice and fresh. It's a busy month for Raid, including daily special events like the new Summer Solstice event called the Path of the Light. They're also running a special Deliana Chase event where you can actually get your hands on Deliana, a new legendary high elf champion. All you got to do is log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and July 20th and you'll unlock her for free. If you click my link in the description or scan the QR code on screen now, you'll get a free bonus worth $30, a free epic champion, Aina, 200k silver, one free energy refill, one XP boost and one ancient shard so you can summon a powerful champion ASAP or waiting for you right here. Enter promo code MYDELANA to get a bunch of silver and 50 XP brews to instantly take her to max level. So check it out and thank you very much Raid for sponsoring this video. But back to Homecoming, where did it go wrong? Was it the victim of being an average game in a franchise of such high esteem or was there more to it? Well, let's take a closer look. <laughs> Where's my squad? Are they here? Did they make it? Homecoming has a dramatic start with our hero, Alex Shepard, being wheeled through a hospital. Along the way, we see countless patients being tortured and it's pretty clear we're in danger. Hey, wait. Where are you going? Don't leave me here! Once in the operating theatre, we see our doctor getting impaled by a suspiciously large sword and we need to escape before we meet the same fate. Right off the bat, you know you're in for a good time because it opens with a f***ing QTE to break the binds. Then, the sweat beads start dripping even faster. When you press X to roll and discover that Alex belongs to a circus and can combat roll around the world like a skater on ice. It's a sight to behold, but a worrying one because Silent Hill is meant to be about a sticky survival horror. It ain't a new entry in the Ninja Gaiden franchise. Scanning the room, we find our medical form. We're in room 206 and scheduled for a lobotomy. Leaving the theatre, we begin our journey through the abandoned hospital. Down the hall, behind the locked gate, we see a child drawing. Nothing out of the ordinary for a horror setting, I know, but Alex appears to recognise the kid. Josh, is that you? It's a little brother, Josh, who sat drawing behind the locked gate, completely ignoring us. We need a key code to get through and in the x-ray room to the right we find the first half of the code, 624. The picture's ripped in half so we set off to find the missing piece. No Alex, that man is not going home. Nothing gets past you. In the newborn nursery we find the other half of the x-ray and head back to grab the code. On the way we get the game's first jump scare. Ooh, spooky. Nothing like a unity asset looking corpse to set the tone. With our breeches browned, we head through to Josh, who for some reason thinks dashing deeper into hell is a good idea. Josh, stop! We chase him through the toilets where he mysteriously disappears. In his place, we find a combat knife. Taking our first weapon, we hear sirens echoing and the paint peels from the walls around us. We've entered the other world. 
a rusty, twisted, nightmare version of reality. Seconds later, from out of the toilet, we encounter our first enemy. This creature is a staple of the Silent Hill franchise, and by Jove, their design gets <coughs> plumper with each iteration. We have to kill her, getting our first taste of combat and tickle my little pickle. The combat is bad in this game. 90% of the time, it just boils down to stun locking the enemy, and if that's not happening, you're being stun locked yourself. Even the animations are ridiculous. You're meant to be surviving against beasts, but Alex is concerned with pulling off sick flourishes. Finishing moves are the nail in the coffin. Finishing moves have no place in a Silent Hill game. That would be like having some roid head punch a boulder in a volcano in a Resident Evil game. Oh, I understand he's meant to be ex-military and that fits the theme, he's combat capable, but there are plenty of roles he could have played within the military without having him act like Captain America. He could have been a medic, for example. In any case, we're in the nightmare version of the hospital now and it's great that there's an actual nightmare world to explore. We head upstairs through a rusty metallic staircase. Visually, I'm conflicted with Homecoming. Overall, the design is well thought out. It's similar in theme to the previous iterations, but there's just something clunky about its execution. I can't put my finger on it. Maybe it's because everything looks a bit blurry. Perhaps it's because of the washed out colour palette. I, I don't know. Through a window, we see a nurse stood in the dark, staring at the TV static. Much like the movies and previous games, the nurses react to light and sound, which actually makes this scene very clever. It's visual storytelling. The nurse is attracted to the light and sound of the TV. So if you turn off your light and move slowly, you can pass through without attracting attention. Trying to sneak past, it was actually pretty tense, and once we're through, we cut open a wall skin tooth thing. I don't know. In the adjacent hallway, we encounter these bug-like creatures with human faces taken straight from the Silent Hill movie. They're fixing to give us some unwanted glug and twist, so we stomp their asses to mush. A more pointless and annoying enemy there never was. Heading through, we find ourselves in another operating theatre, this time with a viewing platform. There are more doctor notes nearby, referencing electroshock therapy and other unpleasant treatments. There's a lot of references to extreme cognitive corrections spread throughout, potentially some kind of foreshadowing. Dropping off the ledge, we land right in the middle of the viper's nest, with three nurses dead ahead. Killing our light, the nurses blindly head in the direction we landed but we're able to sneak round and head upstairs to grab the exit key. It's attached to half a doctor's body, the same one we saw get slashed earlier. And I want you to take a mental note of the body because it's important, we'll be coming back to it later. With the key, we're able to leave the area, finding Josh yet again hiding behind a locked door. What are you doing here? I want my toy. Aren't you afraid of being here alone? I'm a brave soldier. I'd be looking just as dead inside if my sibling was this f***ing annoying. He won't let us through unless we grab his Robbie doll, a doll we find in the nursery room from earlier being sucked up by this wall muff. We get the option to reach inside, something frequently done in the franchise. Reaching blindly into an unknown space to grab something is anxiety inducing. Homecoming though manages to ruin it with a QTE that will instantly kill you if you don't press a button in like three seconds. Now relax and join these cutscenes, boy -o. <laughs> The doll itself is a Robbie Rabbit doll, a returning character that's been featured multiple times across the games. It's just meant to be a nice reference, I don't think it holds any deeper meaning. We bring Josh's doll and his plastic, vampire looking ass refuses to take it, instead running away from us one more time. Now look, I have two little sisters, I love them more than anything, but if either of those two dipshits decided to run deeper into a hell hospital for shits and giggles, they're dead. That's on them. I will not be following. The door mysteriously opens and we may make our way to a large lift where we head down in search of Josh. Well, how about that? It was just a dream. We're in a truck getting a lift to our hometown and arriving, we hop out onto the foggy streets and <gasps> you played in your dream. You played in real life. Freddy Krueger, where you at? It's a dumb oversight. Unless Alex was traveling home with a combat knife, which he then wields as a weapon while walking through his hometown, then it makes sense. In which case, why the fuck was Travis Grady, protagonist of Silent Hill Origins, happy to drive him? That psycho shit, military or not. Bad dream. We're in our hometown of Shepherd's Glen 
which does indeed share the same name as our titular hero. The town is a close neighbour of Silent Hill, but is an entirely separate new area. Moving the focus away from Silent Hill was an interesting choice, although I don't think the concept is a bad idea. Having the Order infest other parts of the world, spreading corruption would have been an interesting way to keep the franchise going. There's only so much you can do within the confines of one town. The first encounter with Shepherd's Glen is surprisingly open. You have to head to your old home, but along the way you can explore the streets and even stop into the town hall and have a look around. Outside of said hallway, we encounter Judge Holloway, who wants to catch up. Alex? <laughs> Judge Holloway. She looks wonky as fuck. Honestly, they were off their rockers when they put this frog looking ass into the game. Her model is from a different fucking console generation. Honestly, you can literally see her floating inside her own jumper. I'm not planning on sticking around for long. Oh. Well, I hope you get a chance to catch up with Elle. I'm sure she'd love to see you. She's still here? <laughs> of course. You know how it is. No one ever leaves this place. When we're good and ready, we take the road up towards Shepard's house. It's obvious by now that something strange is occurring, we just don't know what. Alex's home is the all-American white picket fence dream. It's also completely empty. No one's home. Walking around, we get a feel for the Shepard family. The walls are covered with family photos, and one thing you'll quickly notice is that Alex never appears in any of them. It's only Josh, his younger brother, and the parents. He brushes this off as being the person that takes the pictures, but it's still strange. There doesn't appear to be a single display of affection towards Alex. In our old bedroom, we grab the flashlight, reliving a memory of our past in doing so. Look, take it. If you get scared again, just turn it on. Okay? Thanks, Alex. Afterwards, we hear movement downstairs and go to investigate, discovering our mother, soaking wet, sat in a catatonic state. Mom, what's going on here? What happened? your brother Alex. She's barely responsive, has no useful information and informs us that the basement is flooded. We take the broken revolver and head to the basement to check out the situation. This is the first real creature we've encountered, the Lurker. It's a semi-aquatic creature that attacks with large claws. Their legs are bound and dragged behind them as they pull themselves forward. They're usually hiding just out of sight, ready to ambush Alex in water or under cars. We easily kill the creature, and in another strange oversight, Alex doesn't react in any way to this monster. He says nothing. It ruins the impact of our first encounter. I mean, personally, I'd have a thing or two to say if I visited my mum's house and she'd flooded the basement, then pop populated it with demon fish people, but every family's different. At the back, we find a locked door and have another flashback to our childhood. Dad! What the hell are you doing? You know this place is off limits. I don't ever want to see you in here again. Are we clear? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. The memory suggests an aggressive and potentially even abusive father-son relationship. Are we clear? We need to drain the water so we can access the back door's latch. It's literally just below the surface of the water and Alex, a military lad, is too fucking incompetent to just find it. It's basically a dumb stretch for time. The pump is out of fuel, but thankfully there's a note telling us we can grab some from the garage. So we run upstairs, dash past our mom, who we don't even think to warn about the killer monsters lurking around. We open the garage door, causing another lurker to crawl out. Again, Alex doesn't care. This is business as usual. Home is just how he remembers it. Inside we find a steel pipe which actually has a nice reach advantage and we can use it to pry open locked doors. We grab the gas canister but it's empty.
empty and we have no idea where to get fuel from. Leaving the garage, we get attacked by another lurker from a hole in the wall and with no better options, we follow that path down, crossing a playground, killing another lurker and eventually finding a truck to siphon fuel from. All of this because Alex couldn't move a slide lock without looking at it. And the cherry on top? That door just leads to the garden. Man, climb out a fucking window or over a fence or something, you dumbass. Heading through the fence at the back, we walk up an alleyway and find ourselves in a graveyard. This area is interesting because it's one of the bleakest and most greyed out locations I've ever seen in a game. Not the Silent Hill 2 foggy and grainy kind of look, but rather a bland and lifeless look. It's honestly hard to look at. We pass a strange man digging out a grave and make our way to the centre where Alex gets ambushed by Lassie on roids. <laughs> A fast moving spam attacking arsehole. What does this creature represent? Well, it, it's a fucking dog. It, it represents your mum. What do you want from me? A dog's a dog. And yes, fighting this is as unenjoyable as it looks. We find two halves of a medallion and use them to open a locked gate at the back. Leaving, we arrive just outside a police station where we encounter Ellie, an old flame of Alex's who's hanging up missing people posters. I'm looking for my brother. You seen him? No. What the hell is going on here? I don't know. But every day there are more flyers to put up. Ellie's a bit of a weird character in this game because they decided to not make her detached and weird. She's supposed to be a normal person living a normal life, but it just serves as a bizarre juxtaposition against the horror of the town. Hell, here there's even a crashed police car literally a few feet from her covered in blood. And yet she's all like, hmm, I, I wonder if something strange is going on. Yes, there is, you invalid. Gripes aside, people are disappearing from the town, our brother included. So we we continue the search with a new walkie-talkie to boot. Continuing our exploration, we eventually stumble across an old junkyard. Making our way inside, we encounter Curtis, leading to a painfully awkward conversation. Pretty neglected. It's a damn shame the way people mistreat such nice things. Look, what I really need is some information. Have you seen my brother Joshua? You want to talk to the mayor. He knows everybody's business. Soldiers gotta have a gun. In exchange for the revolver, he gives us a working handgun, our first in the game. He also tells us that the strange man digging in the cemetery earlier was the town mayor. You can ask a few extra questions and Curse is more than happy to oblige. How about I take that shotgun off your hands? Yeah? How about if I slap you and kill you, huh? Wow, that was a touch over the top there, buddy. The only interesting information he gives us is that all the clocks in the town have stopped working at exactly six past two, the same number as our hospital room in the nightmare. I can fix just about anything you put in front of me, but I've never seen anything like this. There's no reason they're not working. It's like there's something causing it. Around Curtis, the work area is cluttered and dirty. You can even find a large pair of gloves and boots in the back that seem out of place. Something Alex actually remarks about, but with no other leads, we decide to head to the cemetery to see if the mayor knows what's going on. Back on the road, we encounter a new monster, the smog. It's basically the lying figure, except now it spits out toxic clouds. It's the lying figure crossed with gleb. In the cemetery, it's overflowing with dogs and smog creatures, too many to fight realistically, so a mad dash to the mayor is the best bet, weaving through the maze of graves and tombs. The area where we first saw the mayor is open now, but he's nowhere to be seen, so we head into a nearby mausoleum to look around. There's a child's coffin inside with the game's first puzzle. We have to arrange the different rectangles to allow the top one to pass through, and it's amazingly simple, and once opened inside, we find a watch. Forgive me. Inspecting this item, Alex suffers some sort of seizure and passes out. We wake up having been mysteriously teleported for the first time to the one, the only, the creme de la hills, Silent Hill. 
but just outside a large crumbling hotel where Josh decides to check in for a little pampering sesh. Problem is, it's not the best looking hotel in the area, so we decide it's best to head in and grab him. The blasted door is sealed shut, mind, so we have to look around the area for something that can break it open, like, say, perhaps this here f***ing fire axe. At least you can actually keep the weapons you find in this game. You don't have to look around every time there's a ball to chop down. Inside, we find Josh just stood there waiting for his AI to kick in. Getting closer, he cucks us again, dashing upstairs by passing through some rubble. The lift is our only way up, but the power is out, so we need to fix it. In the empty elevator shaft, we find the maintenance key, which we can use to access the electric station beside the building. Here we have to solve a wire puzzle. You're meant to rearrange them until all the lights turn green but I managed to just swap a few around randomly and get it right the second try. That's a top 10 epic gamer moment right there. We call the lift and on the way up, we get ganked by some gangly little bastards. Humanoid spider-like creatures with long blades for front legs. We have to fight waves of them as they try and stab us through the metal grate. And once they're all dead, the lift drops multiple floors. So we have to climb out with just enough time to stop ourselves getting cut in two. We're on an unknown floor now, and rather unsettlingly, the first thing we can hear is some old git singing nearby. We hunt down the source and discover what we can assume is an old lady shrouded in darkness. What are you doing in this hotel? This place should be condemned. I can't leave. Not yet. This is no place to be alone. You need to leave. She's lost mementos of her past and wants us to track them down. The game lets us choose whether to help her or not, but you literally can't progress if you say no, so I have no f***ing idea why they even give us the option. Tell me what you need. I'll see what I can do. We head upstairs and grab the first memento, when from down the hallway, we hear some strange beast coming. Of course, it's fucking Pyramid Head. As Law Nuts will well know, Pyramid Head was created to represent James's self guilt in Silent Hill 2, hence why the monster kills itself when James comes to terms with his actions. So, why the fuck? is it here for Alex? I don't know. Neither did fans at the time. And don't give me all that, oh, it's, it's a boogeyman, not a pyramid head. It's not a different monster. No, that's a cope. Something worth noting is that Homecoming takes a lot more inspiration from the Silent Hill movie than from any of the games, which would explain Pyramid Head's sudden appearance and a few other taboo creative decisions. Upstairs, we come face to face with another needler. Their design is human enough to be recognisable, but still twisted. I mean, of course, their fear factor is fucking ruined once you've pulled off a couple of God of War style executions on them. But what can you do? The combat ruins all the monster design. After killing it, we can get a better look at the beast. And for lack of a better term, it looks like he's ate his own head and shut it out. We gather the remaining mementos and bring them back to the singing lady, dodging a small community of creatures along the way. In exchange for the mementos, we get a key for the way out as our reward. Stepping through the door, we see Josh and make the feeblest jump attempt ever. This man is fat rolling. And as usual, Josh is a dickhead and lets us fall to our death. Please help me. Josh. Don't let me fall. Oh. <laughs> We land in front of a large greenhouse, but the door is locked. And on our way back, the world shifts to the nightmare once more. Inside, we find the mayor, a man named Bartlett, who unironically looks like one of the prison monsters from Downpour. It's uncanny. We try and get some answers out of him, but as we've seen so far, he and everyone else are not very helpful. What the hell's happened to Shepherd's Glen? You're the mayor. These people are your responsibility. Now you listen to me, you little asshole. I did everything I could to protect those people. But you can't stop what's already been started. He seems to know more than he's willing to tell us, and it has something to do with his son. What the hell is this? Belongs to your son, doesn't it? Where is he? Joey? Yes, Joey. 
He and my brother were friends. I need to find him. I can't protect them. Protect them from what? What did you do? Something has come. But asking the questions is futile because this conversation is rudely interrupted by a giant beast. It's the game's first boss and it's an interesting one. In fact, all of the bosses in Homecoming are interesting, but in their design and that is it. There's some lovely symbolism as well that I'll get into later, but visually for the most part, they're horrific to look at. They just suck to fight. Some of them are just non-stop spam attacks with the worst hitboxes you'll ever see in a game. This humanoid beast digs its way from the ground and hangs from the ceiling. You can damage it by using your firearm or you can destroy the multiple fleshy sacks hanging around the arena. Using these bookshelves as cover, you know, bookshelves that randomly spawn in after the cutscene, I should add. In its second stage, the beast slumps to the floor and becomes more aggressive. To make matters worse, the bookshelves have de-rendered and returned to their spectral warehouse so we have no cover. And if the hitboxes were bad before, they are pain-inducing now. After giving Seppi the axe, the ground collapses beneath it, dragging it to unknown depths. We step forward, look into the hole and pass out, sending us tumbling further down the rabbit hole. Waking up, it doesn't take long to figure out where we are. We're at the police station and we're trapped. Anybody here? All our equipment is gone and we spend a few minutes walking around the cell until a cutscene plays and we come face to face with Deputy Wheeler. How did I get here? I put you here. Haven't quite made up my mind about you yet. Wheeler, come on, you know me. Let me out. You won't be going anywhere. I get some answers. We actually tell him that the mayor was killed by a monster, which, much to my surprise, goes down a fucking treat. It was some kind of creature, but worse than the others. It, it came to life out of the goddamn tree. That's what killed him, and that's the truth. I swear. So you've seen the creatures too? We should get moving. I'm not sure it's safe here anymore. Follow me. It's nice to see someone that actually notices all the crazy shit happening around them. Wheeler opens the cell and together we make our escape. The deputy serves as a bit of comedic relief, which isn't really the type of character you expect to see in Silent Hill, but hell, it's been so bleak up to this point, I'll take it. Shit, we're not going that way. We explore the station and before long, we're ambushed by a large group of new enemies, the schisms. Wheeler shouts at us to run away to his office and grab our gear in what should be a tense sequence, but I mean, what a f***ing mess. In the office, we receive a call from Elle who's trapped in the car park and needs our help. Something's after me! Elle, head to the parking lot behind the station. We'll meet you there. So the deputy gives us a shotty and we grab all our gear and head off to save her. I'll cover you. Okay. All right. The deputy says he'll cover us and then literally stands there staring at the door. That is until the roof collapses and we get a glimpse at an as of yet unknown creature. It's large and it chases after Wheeler. Wheeler! In the following room, we have our first solo encounter with a group of schisms. Creatures that attack by swinging their pendulum shaped heads. They're an interesting monster with a design obviously inspired by the ancient pendulum torture device. Something hypothesized to have potentially been used to interrogate guilty prisoners, inducing fear as the blade swings lower with every pass. I thought they were easy to kill until I realized they can insta kill you for not button mashing with superhuman speed. They can even hurt each other with their wild blade swings, something I found interesting, though one of the only creatures in the game that can damage other monsters. People 
online really seem to hate the prison level. I think it was based on the constant flow of combat, and it's true, there are enemies that will attack you relentlessly, although it is only a small area, so I didn't find it too painful. We head through the infested station with the goal of reaching the back exit. Once there, you have to open a gate to escape, but it's a nightmare because it's in a little box room with three schisms chasing you, completely blocking your way out of you not careful. There was a broken window, but it wouldn't let me jump through. I was trapped. When I finally slip through, we find L hiding in a police cruiser, only to get ambushed by the large creature from earlier, a monster known as Siam, which we can only assume is some kind of abbreviation of Siamese twins. They're very reminiscent of the Closer from Silent Hill 3, except they appear to have a woman grafted to their back that will stab you with weaponized stilettos if you get too close. He's big and he's bad, but nothing if you well-placed shots from the shot he can't deal with. With the monster dead, we're surrounded on all sides with little more than a chain link fence to protect us. With nowhere to run, L has the genius plan of heading through a manhole into the sewers. Safely underground, we get to know L a bit better, who reveals that her sister is missing too. Your sister, I didn't know. Josh, Joey, Nora, the list of missing children keeps growing. When we find Josh, we're gonna find her too. So now we're in the sewers, which somehow managed to be even more bleak and washed out than anything we've seen up to this point. I mean, oh, the sewers. The whole level sucks ass. It could and should have been removed from the entire game. It would make no difference. In fact, it would make it much better. It's just a bunch of identical tunnels with enemies that f*** you over constantly because there's no space and I think only one healing item in the entire level. We have to score L and fight waves of monsters as she slowly opens gates. It's about as much fun as it sounds. There's even one part where she's meant to be opening a gate for us and the game spawns three. Three f***ing needlers at once that you have to kill before she opens the gate. If you have no health and little ammo, it's damn near impossible. Then, immediately after killing them, a giant f***ing Siam attacks us. What the f*** is this game? Three needlers and a giant monster in a small space without a single health pickup. It's so poorly thought out. After clearing the arena's best champions, Ellie is missing, but the fucking gate just magically opens anyway, you know, just to add insult to injury. At least the level is over, but Ellie is gone, and we need to find her, and her sister, and our brother, and Wheeler. What a great time to be alive. We climb out of the sewers, arriving just in front of our house. But this time, it's different. It's corrupted. We can't just walk in. Barbed wire is blocking the door. We need to find another way. Walking down the road, Wheeler radios through. Hey, I've been better, but I'm okay. Did you find Elle? Oh uh, yeah, but we got separated. I'm looking for her now. Where are you? I'm just now leaving the station to find Fitch. Look, we need to stick together. Meet me at his office. Maybe he knows where Elle is. Okay. I'll meet you there. He managed to survive the police station and wants us to meet him at Finch's office. Heading over on the floor, we find a trail of blood and follow it, discovering Dr. Finch covered in blood, holding a scalpel. Dr. Finch, what do you want? Are you all right? Whose blood is that? What have you done? Stay away from me. He does the mad dash into his practice, so we follow him in. It's empty and all the doors are locked, bar one at the back. It looks like a child's medical room, where we find a picture of the doctor's daughter, Scarlet, and a strange locked case. Also, what happened to Wheeler? He was meant to meet us here, I think the game literally forgot about him. Leaving the room, we discover that nurses have swarmed the hallway. 
It was a clever switcheroo. It caught me off guard and genuinely gave me a fright the first time I played through. Unfortunately, this encounter is once again ruined by poor quality of life. They completely block your way and you can't get past without aggro in them. So I was completely stuck the first couple of times, which is made even worse by their ability to one hit kill us for some stupid reason. We have to crawl through into the newly opened room and grab a key, sneak back and unlock the mysterious case. Picking up the doll, we witness Alex's nutting face and pass out. Waking up once more in the other world, we descend down a metallic, nightmarish landscape with signs representing some kind of medical field. I really enjoyed the environments of this level. It's called Hell Descent and the title really captures the vibe it gives off, heading downwards for what feels like an eternity into this dark metallic void, with the industrial noises getting louder the deeper we go. Eventually, we reach the bottom, where all the sound stops. There's a single door to open and the tension is running high. Inside, we find the doctor with cuts all over his body. Do you need some help? You're bleeding bad. Don't you touch me! I bleed out the sin, but it grows back. We speak to him a little, not getting much out of him. Doctor, stop talking like an idiot and start giving me straight answers. My brother is missing, the mayor's son is missing, and so is Scarlet. I want to know where they are. I don't care about them or you. My princess is the only thing that matters now. Her little hands, pure as porcelain, her smile like sunshine. It's clear something awful has happened to his daughter and he's likely to blame. With no other options, we offer him his daughter's doll, which was a big mistake. Nom nom nom. This is another shitty boss with a decent visual design. It's called the Scarlet, named after the Doctor's daughter. And in phase one, it will stand upright and we have to break off its protective shell. Once each piece is broken, Scarlet moves into phase two, shifting to behave like an aggressive spider. Now it has a much faster moveset, often too fast to get a hit in edgeways, and I swear dodging does not exist in this game. It is a sick practical joke placed by the devs to make people want to die. In fairness, the second phase was piss easy when I discovered you can spam lock it with the blade, pulling off an infinite combo to kill it with ease. Man, this game is a joke at times. Waking up back in the room from earlier with the addition of a founder's key discovered hidden inside the doll. This key can be used at the town hall where Alex remembers seeing a similar shaped podium. We stumble down there with no health and the fear of dying looming over us, just hoping to find some answers. We find the altar and use the key, unlocking a hidden chamber at the center of the room. We follow a concrete tunnel down to a large vault. At an altar at the center, we find a special ceremonial dagger. One that can apparently be used to open our dad's workshop, which is some genius level mental association from Alex. I'd never have assumed that that handle was a bloody ceremonial dagger hidden beneath the town hall. It also replaces our combat knife, dealing slightly more damage, which is ideal for our newfound spam attacking tactic. I had no idea where to go after this point and stupidly left the vault and ran all the way home, assuming we could get through the front door now, but nope. Turns out there's a little teeny weeny little lock on the wall to the left of that chamber so I had to run all the way back and use the knife to unlock it. I don't know if that's just me, but that really was not signposted. This wall opens, revealing a long secret passage, which leads us back to the cemetery, inside one of the locked crypts we passed at the start of the game. We shoot our way out and back into Shepard's home, using the keyblade to finally gain access to the forbidden room. Dude had a fucking spaz 12, absolute legend, best dad ever. We find an attic key and head upstairs. On the way, I tried to see if mum cared about all our near death experiences, but her dialogue hadn't changed. Dad's way better, that motherfucker had a spaz 12. Are we clear? The attic is pretty empty, there's nothing out of the ordinary up here. Aside from an out of place looking bookshelf, pushing it out of the way, we reveal a hidden room, which upon entering we get another flashback. 
I know it doesn't look like much, but this is the most important thing I could ever give to you. Is it worth a million dollars? Much more than that. This is a symbol of our family's past and our future. Can I wear it? Yes. I say it's a flashback, Alex wasn't there, so I don't really know what that's meant to be. There's another square puzzle here, and theory me, if you let yourself get confused, this one can be a nightmare to solve. It took me bloody ages just brainlessly moving the squares around. Once complete, the drawer opens and we find a letter from Dad. It contains some kind of confession, where he claims to have failed the town and that he somehow knows about the cult in Silent Hill. Alex is confused, and wanting some answers, he heads downstairs to speak to his mum, Lillian. You don't know anything about Silent Hill. While arguing, the pair are ambushed and Lillian is kidnapped before Alex can get answers. No! This chaotic event causes the house to shift to the other world, trapping us inside an evil, shittier version of Shepard's home. Mom! The front door is locked shut, and the only way we can get out is by solving four distinct puzzles. In our old bedroom, we find a clock puzzle. We just had to set the time to 2.06, same as all the other clocks. This opens a window where we have to place his Robbie Rabbit doll, unlocking the first seal. In the basement, we have to bring knives we find scattered throughout the house to a butchered schism body, including, and I am not joking, a little teeny weeny baby pyramid head knife. Oh. In the kitchen, we see a mannequin with two faces that represent our mother, and we have to choose from a handful of emotions that represent her behaviour. She acts indifferent, but in reality, she's sad. In the attic, we find our military jacket and have to reattach our medals in a specific order. With these tasks complete, the door can be opened. There's also something very interesting in this level, something very subtle that you could easily have missed. Exploring the house, you find four different schisms, and each one appears to represent the different members of the household. One schism comes at Alex aggressively, attacking us straight away, likely representing Adam Shepard, his abusive dad. In the attic, you can find a schism lying hopelessly on the ground and it won't attack us, seemingly having given up on life. This schism is likely a representation of Lillian, his mother. Then, there are two schisms left. One can be found crouched in a corner, almost sobbing, and the fourth and final schism is in the father's hunting room. This schism has been beheaded and hangs lifelessly. Who and what those two represent, we don't know yet, but it can't be good. We head to the front door and with all four seals activated, it can be opened, returning us to the real world. Outside, we find Elle, who somehow managed to survive. What happened to her? I don't know. They never address her disappearance. It just brushes it under the carpet. Elle, I thought you were- She's gone. Who? My mom. I can't find her anywhere. The entire town's gone. I mean, that's just awful writing, isn't it? He was literally in the middle of trying to ask the most important question, I thought you were dead, and the game literally cuts it off and never brings it up again. It's like the worst way to just overlook a plot hole. Much like Wheeler's disappearance. Speaking of, we get on the blower to the deputy and ask him to secure us a boat so we can reach Silent Hill. Wheeler, I thought we lost you. <laughs> You're not getting rid of me that easy. Glad to hear it. We have a lot to fill you in on. In the meantime, can you get us a boat? We're going to Silent Hill. So the three of them hop on a boat and head towards Silent Hill. It's all a bit of a rushed, awkward segment, you know? Even when he says, we're going to Silent Hill, it's almost like a sitcom. I'm sorry. While shooting the shit, the boat is suddenly ambushed by the cult, and in all this commotion, Alex falls and hits his head on the boat, falling unconscious. I mean, why on earth would the cult be patrolling the lake with a damn speedboat? They're meant to be fanatic, miserable survivors of a demon god, not the villains of a damn Fast and Furious movie. We wake up sometime later on an unknown beach. We clamber up a rotten staircase and arrive at the edge of Silent Hill, receiving a quick call from Wheeler who just will not f***ing die. Thank God you're okay. Listen, they've taken us to the prison. It's horrible. 
They took L and they're about to... Wheeler! Come in, Wheeler! What did they do? Wheeler! They've been taken to the prison, so that's where we head. The front gate is locked and the back entrance is electrified. The only way we can get through is by going to the electric plant and shutting off the power. Padding, padding, padding. Entering the electric plant through the basement, we arrive in a massive generator room which blows my eardrums out my ass. In this room, we encounter the first human enemies of the game. Another design taken straight from the movie. These are cultists wielding various weapons head to toe in mining gear. With our dagger, they don't stand a chance. We fuck them up. It's genuinely impossible for them to even hit you provided you keep spamming the attack. The objective in this room is to turn off the power and to do that we have to twist three valves in a specific order outlined in the plant safety notice board. After which we flip the switch and plunge the area into darkness. What's going on out there? The lights went out and they're running for cover. Did you disable the power? Hang in there, Wheeler. I'm heading back. More cultists arrive and attack in the dark. One of the buggers even has a rifle. Not that it matters because the f***er can't use it, it must really be dark. More ironically, there's this almost glitch-like behaviour where a gunman will infinitely melee you if you get too close, which is fine if you have ammo, but I don't know what you could do if you didn't have a gun there. Outside, the streets are dark and there's more enemies to boot. We run back to the prison and can pass through the gate now, or the gate can pass through us, I should say. Damn, it's another big boy. With the beast killed, we run round the back and enter through the only open door. Ah, prison. An ideal location for any horror game. We head through a security checkpoint and it slams shut behind us, letting us immediately know we're trapped. Heading through a visitor's area and into a cell block, we encounter more cultists and you know what I love about them? They only attack in turns and when they die, it sounds like a cute old bloke getting off the sofa. <coughs> Further along, we discover two guards protecting Wheeler. We save his ass and then team up against another beastie boy messing his shit up. We backtrack to a security room and the two of us devise a plan, with Wheeler sitting at the helm ready to guide us through the prison. We head deeper until we reach the showers, which are overrun with needlers. You do not want to drop the soap with these bad boys around, believe me you. Eventually, our path is completely blocked by a sealed door that Wheeler can't open. Also, he's watching us through a camera here, but they literally didn't bother to add one to the actual hallway. Come on guys, it's the little things. Eventually, we arrive in solitary confinement, being confronted with the horrific sight of Lillian, our mother, in some barbaric device, like something right out of Saw. Your father and I... Only choose one. Mom, please stop. Save your breath. Let me go, Alex. I can't. The device has stretched her to the point where it's killing her, and it's about to stretch even more. So she gives us a difficult choice. She wants a mercy killing. Your choice is made through a QTE, which, as you know, I'm not a big fan of. Dynamic choices are much better. Just let us actually shoot her or walk away, leaving her to her fate. Personally, I think a mercy killing in this situation is the right thing to do. It's okay, Alex. I love you. We shoot her, and just in time, because moments later, the device activates, pulling her apart. Alex doesn't display much emotion to this situation, unless you interact with the body where he claims he should have tried harder. That is all his fault. The trauma of this event has shifted us once again to the other world, with the walls covered in slime and gore. Upstairs, a bizarre contraption rises from the ground with three puzzles to solve. Each wall has a riddle relating to a specific item on a wheel opposite them. We have to identify and select the correct symbol, and when we're sure, we reach inside the hole. Select the wrong answer, you lose your arm, similar to the trap at the start of the game. Pick the right answers, and this disgusting metallic mass will rise up, allowing us to jump through the hole. Oh. At the bottom, we meet Wheeler again, or I think you do. My game glitched out and the camera literally stayed at the top, even though I could hear him talking. Thank God you're alive. I was about to go to 
Even the camera couldn't be asked to keep playing. Together, we traversed the rusty walkways and this entire area is really well made. It's reminiscent of being on a submarine with everything crafted from sheet metal, pipes and valves protruding from every surface. At a back room, we find Judge Holloway, Ellie's mother, and rescue her. You get her loose before they start pumping the gas. I'll shut off the valves. Yeah. Oh, thank God. How did you find me? While distracted, Wheeler's grabbed by some bizarre creature. This is another boss known as Asphyxia, consisting of multiple bodies grafted together human centipede style. It's a decent fight, balanced enough with no crazy moves or blatantly unfair behavior. When the beast is low on health, Alex literally saddles that bitch up and rides it like a prized donkey, choking it to death. Through the smashed window, we see Josh for the hundredth time, and for some reason, Alex isn't getting the picture and decides to chase after him again. Arriving in a courtyard with a large church in the distance, a church that looks identical to the one from the movie. In fact, I'd be shocked if it wasn't directly inspired. Inside, the soundtrack is really great. It's like a holy orchestra mixed with the regular horrific industry sounds, like they're battling each other for dominance. At the altar, we find another slot for our dagger and insert it, causing multiple slots to spring out, each one requiring a plaque that relates to an emotive term like penance or vengeance. Clearly, we need to find these missing plaques and so we head off to find them. Upstairs, we encounter a man in confession. I'm lost. I'm so deep beyond the reach of my faith and I'm seeking further away. This conversation is meant to parallel the relationship between Alex and his father. In fact, the person speaking is almost certainly some kind of manifestation of Adam. I treated the dog with more respect. And when I was given a second son, the first might as well have been a stranger sleeping in our house. Here we get given a choice to forgive him or not, which actually affects the ending of the game, not that the importance of the choice is stressed here in any way. Whether we forgive him or not, he disappears, and in his place, he leaves the kneeling man plaque. We gather the other three with ease and find the final one on the balcony window. only to fall victim to a bloody gankin. Thankfully, I saved my shotgun ammo, so I wasn't in any real danger here. At the altar, we have to assign the plaques to their corresponding emotions. Using our massive gamer brains and understanding of emotive words, we speed through the puzzle. Solving it causes the stage to open, revealing our father bound by both arms where he drops a massive revelation on us. I never meant to hurt you, son. I had to make a choice. And now I'm paying for it. We all are. After all I've done, you still wear my old dog tags. That must mean something. Talking about. These are mine. I'm a soldier, just like you wanted. Alex, you've been in the hospital. I know. I was wounded in battle. No, a mental hospital. You've been there ever since the accident. We were never in the army. We were in a mental hospital after an unspecified traumatic event and suffering from memory loss, we made up our military service. As a twist, it's not too surprising. There were constant references to mental correction procedures scattered throughout, but it's also kind of dumb. Like where did he get the military outfit and combat knife from? Did the hospital give it to him when he was discharged? Or did he run off and buy it from a costume shop before hitching a ride at the start of the game? Sure, his dad was in the military, but he arrived from out of town in the outfit. It would have made more sense if Alex changed into the fatigues after arriving home. But regardless, his time is up because along comes Triangle Man to make some sashimi. No! 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 
I just bloody love that Pyramid Head randomly comes along to cut him in half. And you know what? I'm almost certain that that wasn't the original plan. You can literally see the device he's tied to looks as if it was designed to pull him in half. But nah, I gotta cash in in that triangle head, man. In fairness to the devs, they did add some level of depth to this scene. Because if we remember back to earlier, to the doctor I mentioned at the start of the video, this doctor is Adam. It's the same model. He was killed by Pyramid Head, getting cut in half in the exact same way. Taking this a step further, the schisms themselves could be a reference and appearance to his parents' death. Both of them were split in two, just like the pendulum blade. Passing through our father's remains, we head to an underground mine, with living barbed wire blocking the path behind us. At the bottom, hot steam is blocking our way, so we have to equip the cultist outfit to pass through unharmed. Opening the cargo lift, who do we see other than the snarky arsehole from the junkyard, Curtis? Which is a good time to remind everyone of the weird outfit we remarked on earlier in this video. See, the game does try to build layers of depth, you have to give them that. He boasts ominously about his love for his work, before smashing you in the back, knocking you unconscious. So much for the inconspicuous disguise. We're dragged through the mines and later wake up to find Judge Holloway staring at us. Family is the most important thing, Alex. I would do anything to protect them. That's why I sacrificed my daughter. What? She's one of the bad ones and admits to sacrificing her own daughter to the cult, something every founding family has to do. Each boss we've encountered so far represents a way the child was murdered. Joey was buried alive, Scarlet was dismembered, and Nora was suffocated. Each creature was trying to kill their murderous parent. Two succeeded and one failed. Judge Holloway orders Curtis to punish her daughter and then grabs a nearby drill and starts looking to rather savagely recreate her favourite scene from Hostel. We manage to break free and Holloway pulls a postal three level facial animation. Why is she so poorly made? She's a major bloody character. In fact, she looks like the camper that screams in the Friday the 13th game. This entire scene was so gruesome, it almost got the game banned in a few countries and gave them a bunch of censorship troubles in Australia and Germany. We grab our knife from the table behind us and head off to save Ellie before it's too late. In a different torture chamber, we find the remains of an officer with a pipe lodged through him. Clearly this area is where all the missing townspeople have ended up. We grab it and continue through the halls with the echoing sounds of screams ringing out. After fighting a bunch of cultists, we discover Elle, with Curtis getting ready to dice her up. Now, it's a race against time. We have to jump over a fence, push a fridge out of the way and break through a door. Arriving just in time, we face off against the mighty Curtis, who literally cannot touch me to save his life because I spam attack knife combos more than your average Londoner. We free Ellie and make our way out, even running into Wheeler again, which makes no sense. The man cannot die. Hell, he's not even dead now, and he's been turned into a pincushion. We can let him bleed out or give him a med pack. I obviously gave him the med pack in anticipation of more slapstick, but he just sits there gasping. He never says anything. <sighs> I feel like the devs were confused at what to do with this lad, unless having him just randomly turn up was a running gag within the dev team or something. We tell Elle to leave the mine with Wheeler and set off alone. In a large room, there's one last puzzle to solve. We have to spin wheels to make the two symbols represent the family's purpose and method of execution. Thankfully, the doc left his medical pad and pill pot where he was standing so we know who belongs where. Thank God. Like when I'm about to pull off a ritual, I always pull out my play button and mic and leave them on the floor. You know, it's just what you do. You've got to flex your profession. After solving the puzzle, we head through a large pair of doors into some kind of ritual chamber. It has four altars, each one relating to the founding families of Shepherd's Glen and naming their four generations of sacrifices, including our family. And upon closer inspection, we discover our name is the most recent sacrifice. Dad never wants us out on the lake. Not you, anyway. Dad thinks you're a little baby who can't do anything on his own. Yeah? Then why'd he give me this? What is that? That's Dad's ring. What a piece of crap. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's worth more than a million dollars. That's why Dad gave it to me. <laughs> give that back!
Yet another revelation. It was us that killed Josh by mistake while fighting on a boat. Adam openly admits that Alex was the selected choice for sacrifice. But after the death of Josh, rather than lose both children, Alex is sent to a mental asylum, breaking the cult's pact. The fact that Josh was dead all along was obvious. Anyone could see that coming. But the fact that Alex accidentally killed him and that Alex was the intended sacrifice was kind of a clever twist. Freak if he finds out. This explains the coldness of his home life. There were no photos of him at all. He was never considered part of the family. They had to be cruel and keep their distance to stop themselves becoming too close. Both his parents being split in half could even be seen as symbolism for the duality of his parents deciding between which of the two children to sacrifice. We loved you so much. They said could only choose one. At the time of Josh's death, Adam's watch is shown and it's six minutes past two. This was the moment the wrong child was sacrificed and the pack with the gods broken, seemingly freezing time on the spot for Shepherd's Glen and explaining the countless references to the number 206. Returning to present day in the chamber, our trauma has caused the world to shift and from the roof, down drops the final boss. <laughs> A giant spider-like creature with very clear symbolism, that of a pregnant woman, representing the maternal cruelty displayed by his parents. Its spider-like appearance could also be a reference to Josh's love for spiders. This fight is a piece of piss compared to the other bosses. There's not much to say about it. We shoot and stab our way through its two phases and eventually we best it. Here, Alex finally comes to terms with what he's done. He leaves the ring and torch on Josh's body and walks away. Here, buddy. Take this. God. Now, there are five different endings to Homecoming, depending on the choices we make. Each ending unlocks a different outfit, and they're all awful. Spoilers. The good ending is remarkably shit. We leave the mines, find Ellie, give her a hug, and walk away. What you see in there? That's literally it. That's the entire ending. There's no real closure or hint at what's next for Alex. Absolutely no mention of what happened to Wheeler, even though we saved him. Just a hug and a little slap on the tush. We have to forgive our father and mercy kill our mother to get this ending. It's like two minutes long. It's a joke. The drowning ending is a bit different. In this one, we wake up in a bathtub and Adam comes in, thanks us for the sacrifice and drowns us. Friends, your sacrifice will save us all. Joshua will be safe to carry on the family name. It's a super short scene, so we can't infer much from it. It could just be Alex imagining what his fate could have been, or it's implied that the entire events of the game take place in Alex's head and that he never killed his brother and that he was the sacrifice all along. I don't know. There's also no context to this ending. We go from saying goodbye to Josh in an altar underground to being drowned in your family home with Josh alive. You get this ending by Mercy killing your mum, but choosing not to forgive your dad. In the third ending, we wake up in the same hospital room from the start of the game, room 206, only to discover that the events were in Alex's head and that he's still in the hospital receiving electroshock therapy until he accepts his reality. It's not working. I didn't go anywhere. No, Alex. And you won't be going anywhere until you can start to accept reality and responsibility. It's so on the nose, it's comical. He literally shouts out, so I didn't go anywhere. Which I mean, okay, fine. He's stuck in a hospital. If that's what they were going for, you'd think they'd at least go the extra mile and make him look like a patient. You don't get electroshock therapy in your daddy's fucking military fatigues. There's your standard UFO ending. You can unlock this by not forgiving your dad, not mercy killing your mum, but choosing to save Wheeler. Take it to your body. 
I knew it. His entire existence is just to facilitate a meme ending, which really hammers home the dumbest part about the different endings. The unlock criteria don't have anything to do with what happens afterwards. The endings are just randomly distributed across the different choice combinations without any thought, I swear. Oh, but I saved the best till last, the boogeyman ending. Alex wakes up strapped to a chair and two boogeymen approach him and place a pyramid helmet on his head. Then Alex becomes a boogeyman, letting out a Darth Vader no for effect. I mean, what the f*** were the developers thinking? It's an absolute bastardization of an icon. And are there roids in that helmet? Why has it made him swole and tore off his jacket? Is that literally all the triangle was? A massive roid intravenous? It goes without saying that this is an awful ending. Humanizing Pyramid Head is stupid. It's like the developers thought that all the fans wanted to see was more Pyramid Head, no matter the context or what it does for the character's legacy. The entire appeal of Pyramid Head as a design was that he's entirely human and entirely non-human at the same time. No one wanted any context for what's underneath the helmet because it ruins the beautiful mystery. It's shocking that this crap was greenlit. The endings are all over the place, they're poorly made, there's no consistent themes and they leave us with more questions than answers. I think what I hate about these later games is that they can't decide on a theme and just stick with it. Major spoilers here, but what was great about Silent Hill 2's ending was no matter what, James always kills Maria. The only effect our actions had throughout the course of the game was changing how he reacted to this after the fact. It's almost like there's a fear of people not liking the decisions and so they throw in a bunch of random crap hoping to please all cats but a friend of all is true friend to none and that is true with video games as well. To summarise my experience, between the extreme technical issues, the painful combat and the awful concluding segments, Silent Hill Homecoming is, in my opinion, the worst mainline entry. You are of course welcome to love it, that's the beauty of having an opinion, you contrary little bitch. It has its moments where you think, huh, you know what, this is well thought out, this design is creepy. If you were to take the best parts of Downpour and the best parts of Homecoming, merge them together and cut out all the shit, I think you'd be onto a real winner. I always go into these videos with the aim of enjoying the game. I never go in looking to bash something people have worked on because making an entire video game is always an extremely hard task. There's just something about Homecoming though. Every time I found myself enjoying it, something would happen, some dumb, poorly thought out boss or decision that would pull me back to finding the game annoying. I thought you were Stop interrupting me. In my previous video on Downpour, I concluded with my wishes that Konami would stop sitting on the IP and in the following week, much to my surprise, it was leaked that there are apparently three Silent Hill games in development. This is alleged and unconfirmed, but Konami did issue a copyright takedown on the leaks, which likely wouldn't happen if it were a fabrication. But still, take this with a pinch of salt. There's apparently meant to be one mainline entry that people speculate could be set in the UK, which if true, I'm more than happy to lend my voice as an actor. Bloody geezer over there got a pyramid on his head. F***ing nonce. Uh, someone please sample that as my audition tape. There's also meant to be a Silent Hill 2 remake under way by Blooper Team, creators of Layers of Fear and The Medium, which, you know, meh. I don't really see why this needs a remake, it still holds up really well, they just need to make it bloody playable. Finally, there's meant to be an interactive story based game in the works, along the same vein as Until Dawn, which, you know, it could be a decent hit if they have a compelling story, but at this point it's all hearsay, so we'll have to wait and see. Maybe in a few years time, I'll be making another long form video talking about the mainline release and either gushing over it or crying tears of salty rage. Life really is full of mystery. But uh, you wouldn't want to miss this hypothetical review, would you? Well in that case, how about hitting the subscribe button? It's free and it really helps fuel my ego. Also, my schedule will be super messed up for a while. I'm on holiday for a week, pretty much from the time this video goes live, so you might not hear from me for a while. Feel free to follow me on Instagram or Twitter though, and I'll keep you updated from there. Hell, maybe I'll even upload a holiday feet pic. <laughs> what a treat. The links will be in the description. Until then, thank you very much for watching, dear friend. Big thanks to Raid for sponsoring this video and I'll see you next time.